EurosCon 2022. How are we feeling today? I feel it, I feel it, I know it. It's Saturday, for those of you that were here yesterday, they probably had a full day as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm like running off of Red Bull and uh, caffeine myself. Uh, and I know that we're just getting to, to know each other, but I've got this tradition when it comes to um, uh, hosting panels, and I hope that you know, I can get you guys to partake in this. I have a little bit of a competitive edge when it comes to panels, and I know that there is a panel taking place, I think, to the right of us, maybe even to the left of us. I want to, uh, yeah, probably to the left of us, or at least down the hallway. Um, and I want the other two panels to be able to hear us and get jealous that they're not in this room with us. I want them to think that, damn, I really missed out on that Charles Best and David Peterson um, uh, panel. So I want to try that again, but if you guys will keep that in mind, that'd mean a lot to me. All right, so let me try that one more time. Heroes Con 2022, how are we feeling today? They beat me to it, but uh, let's give another round of applause for our esteemed guest today, Charles Vest. <laughs> uh, I want to thank all of you for taking time to attend this panel. Uh, I know I really appreciate it, and I can probably speak on behalf of our esteemed guests that they also share the same feeling. Uh, before um, we really get started, I want to introduce myself uh, to you guys as well. My name is Bada Milligan. I'll be hosting today's panel. I'm also the host of the long-running comic podcast, The Short Box, AKA the best comic podcast in the multiverse. And I say that with a full 100% money back guarantee. If you don't like the show for whatever reason, I'll refund you your money. The best part is the show is free, so that's a win-win for the both of us, all right? J terrible jokes aside, um, I, I do encourage you, if you like uh, well-researched and entertaining uh, discussions about comic books and reviews, as well as interviews with some of the best creators in the industry, check out the short box for your own when you get home. It's available on all podcast apps. But with that out of the way, oh, you might hear this panel on uh, the episode next week. Uh, so I highly encourage you to take part in the Q&A. At the end of it, I'll carve out about uh, 30, maybe 20 minutes for Q&A for you guys to ask questions directly to Charles and David here. Uh, but welcome to World of Building with Charles Vest and David Peterson. Today's panel, it's gonna be it's gonna be a fun, laid-back conversation between these two giants in the comic book industry. Short giants. Shortest <laughs> giants you'll ever meet. Yeah. But between these two gentlemen, we're talking close to, if not well over 40 years of professional comic making experience. Both of them have a long list of uh, see look, look uh, all that cheering brought more folks from the other panel. I'm telling you, it works every time. It works every time. Uh, but both of these gentlemen have a long list of Eisner-nominated and winning bodies of work. They've got uh, a dedicated fan base. Their work means a lot to, to a lot of different people, right? So we're fortunate enough to have both of these guys here um, to talk about what they do best, you know? Um, I, I don't think there's any hyperbole to be found if I was to say that they have helped lift and interlace traditional fantasy world-building elements in the comic book storytelling, which is usually, you know, reserved I think for your you know classic kind of uh, uh, fiction prose, so it's cool to uh, have their particular uh, and unique element and signature uh, brought into comics and really kind of uplifting the medium. So, all that out of the way, we're going to get on to our scene guest, Charles and David. Thank you guys so much for for being out here today. Man. Yeah. 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 How are your conventions going so far? I, I imagine neither of you are strangers to hear us on at all. How's it going so far? Great. Easy. Yeah. Nice deep. Good Easy back. drive. It's all good. Do you live close by? Three hours. Oh, nice. Nice. It's good to be back. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Yeah, I agree, 100%. And, and it sounds like both of you are no strangers to you know the convention circuit or, or panels. You know, we're here celebrating a major milestone for Heroes Convention, or Heroes Con. Uh, you know, so it's their 40th anniversary, and I was curious to hear, you know, what, what words come to mind when you think of the legacy of Heroes Con and the environment that they've built for not only, you know, uh, fans of the media, but also creators as well. You know, what, what do you think when you think about Heroes Con? A uh, fun and family, people-friendly convention. Hmm. That's yeah. easy to negotiate. Yeah, I think, of, I think of loyal fandom, um, 
and, and it's fans that are interested in finding comic material and discovering creators and really supporting creators. It's not just uh, you know collectible gathering. It's not just uh, pop, you know collecting a popular character. Just you know going around and whatever Deadpool is what I want. Or man, I'm gonna go get some toys. Or, and that stuff's great too. But this is a convention where people either already know the artists and want to have that connection with them, or they're looking to discover a new artist and they want to make a connection with them. Well said. Can I agree more? And, and maybe David, you could take uh, this question first. But do you think it's still important, you know, for creators to meet, you know, uh, the, the fans and the people that support them, like in person? And what benefits and challenges are there for, like, when it comes from the creator side, when it comes to attending conventions on a regular basis? Yeah, of course it's important. I mean, it's uh, it's it, it is easier now online that we can still meet. Like I stream on Twitch uh, twice a week, and I have lots of people that I recognize because of their names. Um, some of those people I know in real life, having done conventions and gotten to meet them and know them in real life, but there are lots of people I just recognize because of a username. Um, that's still a really good, valuable connection, but yeah, obviously being able to see each other in person and recognize faces and and no backstories, you know, there's people who tell me why they got the book or how they found the book or, um, and, or who they got the book for and then I get to watch maybe a kid grow up over the years yeah. or, yes. you know, there's, it's, we're, we're humans, you know, we're, we're, none of us are machines, this is all interactions, you know, when I'm sharing a story, <laughs> when I'm sharing a story, it's because I'm trying to share something with you. So when you get to share something back by me getting to meet you, that's important. Good, agree more. Charlie, did you want to chime in on that question? Well, I don't, I'm not online as much, a lot of, as you are, <laughs> but, uh, so I'm in my studio by myself, and I might have five or six people that will come and visit over the six months I'm working on a project, so uh, it's really nice to, get out and get a real-time reaction to what you've done. And it's nice to talk to them, everyone. Uh, it's just, I enjoy it. So sometimes you're sitting there by yourself going, is anyone ever going to read this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, creation is a lonely process. Yeah. I've heard that. I've heard that. Um, so th this next question I've got, and I think I probably speak on behalf of a lot of folks here. I know I've had a lot of... Uh, fanboy moments of meeting like, you know, my idols and, and people that I've looked up to and, and, you know, studied throughout the years that have made me fall in love with this medium. I was curious if, if either one of you can recall a moment or tell a story where you, you know, had your own, like, geek out moment or a, a hardcore fanboy moment of meeting, you know, one of your contemporaries or, or professional idols. Uh, Will Eisner? <laughs> you know, it, uh, years ago, I... I was at a science fiction convention and Ursula Gwynn was there and I was too bashful to go talk to her because I thought, oh, the only thing I'm gonna be able to say is, gee, I really like your books. <laughs> but that's okay <laughs> to say that. Uh, and it meant that when I worked on this uh, illustrated Ursi book and I worked with her emailing and talking on the phone for about four years, but I never got to meet her because she passed away right after the book was done and I was getting ready to fly out and see her. So uh, talk, you know, talk to your uh, heroes. And uh, most of the time, they're really nice to talk to. Not always, most of them. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like meeting uh, Will Eisen? What was that story like? It was, I was tongue-tied. You know, I'd grown up reading his books and uh, loved the spirit and loved his graphic novels. And, I was getting, I was producing a, a self-published comic book, and um, various friends said, "You need to send a copy of it to him." I'm like, "Oh my God, I do!" <laughs> so I did, and he wrote me back a really nice letter that I could take a few lines out and use for a copy. Is it Frank? You got that uh, letter Frank? No, no. It was. In, I should. It's in my. I'm getting ready to move my studio. Uh, I'm building one on my property instead of renting one, and um, 
uh, I'm clearing out lots of files. So there's a lot, you know, there are all these letters that people wrote me in 1995 uh, when I first started self-publishing, and you're like, I don't need this asking a uh, letter asking for a subscription to this comic <laughs> book. You just don't need it. <laughs> you know? How many of you? Uh, how many of you in here would help uh, Charles Best move uh, his studio? We got a bunch of movers. Yeah, we got trucks right here. Plenty of uh, able bodies. All my, my assistant at the booth, Nick, insisted on bringing lots and lots of books because he said if we don't sell them, right <laughs> everything's got to go. Ten percent yes. off. Fifty percent off. I got it. And, and David, I've, I've read that, um, I've read an a interview where, you know, you spoke very highly about Mike Mignola's influence on you. Did you ever have a chance to meet him or yes. maybe like another conference? Yeah, I've, I've met him several times. Uh, I, I had met him even before I was a creator, just, you know, as a fan, I got some stuff signed. Um, I didn't know, and he was kind of like Charles, it's like, you want to go, like, what do you say? I don't know. And then now as a creator, I also realize like there's no harm when people say like, oh, I know you hear this all the time. I'm sorry, but yeah, I think your work's great. And it's like, why do you think I would ever get sick of hearing? <laughs> no, no, no. That's a nice thing to say. Say it as much as you want. Let me record it. Let me record it so I can just move it back. But you do worry, like you're gonna go up and be like, yeah, I'm the 50th person in this line to tell you that I really enjoy your work and I think it's great. Um, so I was like, well, I, I gotta come up with something. So I told him, uh, I said, thanks for giving me a reason to go to the comic shop. Hmm. And he went, thanks for going to the comic shop. <laughs> and that was it. And I thought, like, well, at least that was a unique conversation. It was different than anybody else. <laughs> but the first time that I ever sat up, set up, uh, was within the first year of Mouse Card getting published, um, I was set up in San Diego, and I knew the guy who was directing the Hellboy animated series. And he said, I'm hanging out with the Mignolas at San Diego. I'm gonna see if I can kind of direct them over by where you're sitting. And maybe, maybe they'll come by your booth. And I was like, oh yeah. So I, he's tall. And I saw him, he, uh, the, the director is tall. I saw him and he kind of like gave me the high sign. And the Mignolas came up and Mike just kind of sat back. Christine was doing, his wife Christine was doing more of the talking and then Mike just shook his head and he went, you're a genius. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> you know, it was like, okay, I, don't, I mean, I've had lots more good interactions with him since, but it was like, yeah, if that's it, if we're done, <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. I'm surprised you haven't used that as a byline on a website or something. <laughs> Dave Keys, creator of Mouse Club. Yeah. You're a genius. It's, <laughs> like, there's something about keeping that one private. I mean, not private, like obviously I told you, but it's like, <laughs> that one doesn't go on a book. That one goes in my heart. Yeah, yeah. mostly. Wow. I appreciate you for sharing that. Here at Congo, we say thank you for that awesome story. For sharing. <laughs> So one thing that I enjoyed, um, uh, you know, getting to meet you guys for the first time today and, you know, doing my introduction was that um, both of you already have, you know, you guys already know each other, you guys have met, uh, there seems to be, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, a relationship that you guys uh, professionally, um, which is always nice for me, you know, especially as the, the moderator that, you know, there is a, a prior history that you guys know each other. Um, so I was curious about that, like when did you guys first meet each other? Or what was your first conscious exposure to uh, one another's work? And maybe Charles, if you want to take that first. Uh, it would have been Mouse Guard coming out, and I ordered it through my comic book shop, and I enjoyed it. Oh, okay. You got my little, my money. Sounds <laughs> 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 like the 2000s. It's right there. I'm sure you're, you know, usually San Diego, you're going to see people, but it's, you know, 10 billion people, so sometimes you don't get to talk to the people you wanted to, and which is another reason I like to come here, because you can actually yeah. talk to everyone that you want to talk to. Uh, so probably here that we really Actually, talk. Our, our first, our, it was San Diego. Um, okay. Yeah. It wasn't very long. You might not remember it. I remember it. <laughs> I, 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 Tell I, me. I knew you were working the pros. Right. That was my exposure to you, and uh, I, you were at San Diego, and you had, you had a print, like a, a preview, it was almost like a print sample of Greenwood. Oh, um, right, it was the chat book. Yeah, and yeah. it was, it was this horizontal, and it had, it was really interestingly printed, 
like the cover stock was really nice, and I think it had even like a gold stamp. Yeah, on yeah, it. copper on stamp. The copper stamp on the cover. I was like, that's just really nice production design, even if it's just a sample or a sketchbook yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, I knew it would work. There were three hundred of those. That's it. I still got one. I got them printed at um, uh, Kinkos. Put <laughs> 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 together and very things glued on it. It was all. It was a definite. Uh, it, it was uh, nice. Yeah, it's I mean, for that. Not that King, I'm not yeah. sliding off Kinkos, but that looked like a higher end production. Than <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I stopped. I knew who you were, but I like my end was let's talk about book production. Let's yeah. talk. Let's talk about paper and copper foil and and placement of art versus tax. It's funny that you mentioned, you mentioned Rose because Rose is why the Greenwood exists because I was working on Rose and I don't know, you, you've got this thing where if it's uh, two months, it used to be if it's over two months late then you have to re-solicit mm -hmm. and Jeff called me up and said, okay, I know we're running behind but we need to have this book done by this certain amount of time. So I spent about three weeks of 18 hour days at my studio painting the last issue of Rose. And I only, for, I would take a break each day and walk on this trail, walking trail that's near the studio. And uh, the first day I was on the trail, it was fall, it was pretty long. But way down the trail, there was a, a squirrel jumped out and onto the path and started running toward me and had a big uh, acorn in its mouth. And in my head, I'm going, oh, it's going to run up to me, drop it at my feet, and go, enjoy the quest, and run off. Because it did, and then the big scary human ran off. But from that moment on, a story started coming into my head. And when that happens, you don't be stupid and not listen to it. You start writing it down. And uh, that's what the green Greenwood came from that. So there you go. See, it all ties together. It's all one. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and I think a good uh, transition to uh, my, my next subject, you know, um, across, you know, both of your bodies of work, vast bodies of work, there is there's a, a sense of, like, richness and expansiveness in, in the characters, geography, as, as well as the history. So it's no surprise that, you know, um, the powers that be have both of you on this panel, but it's also no surprise that they use, you know, the word, uh, word world building. You know, I think it comes to mind when you think, um, uh, when you think of both of your names, um, and I was curious, what does world building mean to you, particularly? Like, how does that word resonate with you? And David, if you want to take that. Uh, it's it's about making something that that feels it feels even though it's, we all know it's fiction, it feels real. Um, yeah, it, and it feels believable between the characters. Uh, yeah, it's, and it's everything. It's it's everything. Uh, and I don't mean that like, oh, it's everything. I mean like. Every element of what you're drawing or not drawing or writing about or not drawing about is world building. Like, it's just as much what you include as what you don't include. Um, it's about setting a tone and a vibe. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's this overall setting. It's like <coughs> part of its genre, part of its architecture, part of its maps, but part of its culture, mm -hmm. part of its, their history. Whether you're showing it or not showing it, it's there. It's, how do you want to guide the audience to believe that it's real? Well said. Well said. Charles, what are some of your, well, one, do you want to take a stab at that question? Uh, well, I would, to me, world building is part of this, the most important thing you do as a storyteller of getting the viewer or reader involved in the story. And if you don't get them involved, then you bluff. But one of the ways to do that, and just, I, I came into, from definitely a visual thing was, you know, I would see paintings, there's a painter, N.C. White, that I love, and he would then have a figure standing there, and he's maybe looking or doing something, but there's a shadow going across him, and it's from some tree that is not shown, and that the viewer will look at that, and in their mind, they will think of what that tree looks like. So they are already building this world that you're involved in, and it's something you have to be aware of when you're doing it. It's just suggesting things. It shouldn't show everything uh, and have the viewer involved and part of the story, and then everything's good. Hmm. Well said. What, what would be some of your favorite, outside of, you know, obviously your own, your own bodies of work, but what are some of your favorite examples 
of, of world building, of someone that's like managed to accomplish that, you know, in space. Uh, neither Charles nor I could figure out how to pronounce his name, but Rin Portlevit, I believe, is the closest one. Yeah, that sounds guy, good. He's the guy who illustrated the gnome in this book. Um, if you're familiar with David the Gnome, which was an animated show, before David the Gnome was an animated show, there was a, uh, a, a, a Dutch, very popular yeah, a, a Dutch illustrator who, who painted this, uh, this book that was almost like a field guide of here's gnomes and here's how they live and here's how the animals it's cutaways of their houses, it's showing their pottery, it's showing how they even like get the clay yeah. from the earth, how do they how do they do medicine, how do, how do they eat, like, what are their mating cultures, what are the it's just like this full encyclopedia history about gnomes. And uh, that was a big one for me. Uh, and then I think the Dark Crystal is probably the other one where it's like that is a in a that is such an immersive world, and partly because you know everybody talks about Labyrinth and Dark Crystal is like they're, you know, they go together. And it's like, but not. the thing about Dark Crystal that's unique <clears throat> is you never see a human being. You don't see a single part of a human being. Um, where, you know, we saw David Bowie, we saw uh, uh, Jennifer Tom Um But that's how, that, that's how immersive the world of Thra from Dark Crystal is. It's, it's its own, it's so much its own thing. It could completely exist without any of us ever being a part of it. Um, and the two distinct cultures of the Skeksis and the Mystics, and also this backstory about this genocide for the Elflings, and it was like, it's all there. There's, this, there's a whole world there, and it's only a you know 90 minute movie. Hmm. Thanks. Awesome. And uh, Charles, this one's for you. What's your approach to, you know, starting or creating a world? Like, does it start with the, the characters or the geography or history or, or culture like, like David brought up? Like, do you start somewhere specific or you, I mean, or do you allow, or do you go in a different direction? Um, I've done this any number of times. Uh, I wrote and drew and painted a Spider-Man graphic novel, Spirits of the Earth, and I, and Stardust, too. Uh, I would, before I even started drawing any of the characters, I would uh, draw the city, the landscape, the where they are. I want to know, you know, where someone is in my head, so uh, they're walking in the right place. <laughs> uh, with the Spider-Man, it was easy because I set it in this town of Plockton on the west coast of Scotland and I spent a lot of time there, and I just, uh, so the city was the same. I put people that I knew there into the comic the strip, and uh, Stardust was a little harder, but you know, Neil had described various things, but I, I worked out a, a uh, city plan, village, it would be village, if it's not a city, and all sorts of things, and then started drawing the characters. And I t actually talk a lot about this. There's a there's a book that just that came out last September called The Art of Stardust, and it's an uh, informal history of how the whole book came to be. And I talk a lot about where I came up with characters and where I developed things, and not just talked about it. I show it to, uh, and I think I just like a sense of place a lot when I do things. Uh, I want to know what time of year it is. There's just a lot of questions I have when I uh, approach a story. That's a lot of things to juggle, a lot of things. Yes. And you brought up uh, Spider-Man Spirits of the Earth. I, I remember when my dad uh, first gave me that book, he was like, boy, let me show you what real art looked like. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I was really young, you know? I was like, dad, it's Spider-Man in Scotland. How cool can it really be? Blew my mind. <laughs> What's it gonna swing from? There's no building. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, that was why I put it there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're both no stranger uh, to reinterpreting classic literature into comic form for a for modern audience. You know, I think uh, Wind of the Willows, Books of the Earth Sea, um, and maybe David, if you want to uh, kick us off with this one. But is it easier or more challenging to take on the uh, task of reinterpreting from classic literature than say, you know, working from a traditional comic script or you know, uh, uh, writing in that method? Oh, Mouse Guard's easier than Wind of the Willows was. When I, Wind of the Willows wasn't a comic, it was <coughs> the original prose by Kenneth Graham, and I illustrated it. Um, 
And it was a bucket list. Winter of the Willows was a bucket list project. I, I knew that I always, at some point before I died, I wanted to illustrate Winter of the Willows. And I got my chance to do it. But it was way harder from that, mm -hmm. how do you approach this standpoint than Mouse Guard. Mouse Guard is exactly what I want it to be and can change based on my whim of what I want it to be. You know, what I want it to be this year is probably different than what I wanted it to be six years ago or even three years ago. And sometimes I can even change month to month. Like, yeah, I'm more in this mood, so this is the way Mouse Guard's gonna go, both in tone and you know style and everything. Uh, Wind of the Willows had to be consistent, had to also follow this tradition of the hundreds of other Wind of the Willows illustrators who have already tackled all these same moments. It's not just the characters, it's there are moments in the book that when you read the, like I read the book, I made a list every time I got to a point uh, I birthed the gates of dawn. It, well, you, ah. yeah, but you get to a point where you're like, okay, that's an illustratable moment. That's an illustratable moment. That's mm -hmm. and I made this list, and then when you know that you only have seventy illustrations, right. they, they, only yeah. seven. But you only have seventy. You start narrowing it down to which are the most important. And guess what? Those are the same seventy that every other illustrator yeah. has done. So now <laughs> illustrate that exact moment from that book in a way that doesn't feel derivative of anybody else. Mm -hmm. That's uniquely you but also is paying service to the original text and kind of the general mood spirit of what we all understand Wind of the Willows to be about. It was uh, frustratingly hard. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, and when you're illustrating something that millions of people have read uh, over many, many years, and they've all got their own idea of what these characters look like, you have to... Uh, uh, <laughs> it's, a little tiptoeing around trying to make sure you don't destroy their image. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was actually yeah. less about the character designs. Uh -huh. That I felt like I could have a little more freedom with. Although there's like there's a character called the, the Wayfarer, which is a like ratty from Wind of the Willows. Actually it isn't a rat, he's a water rat, which means he's a muskrat, right? Mm -hmm. Um but ratty meets a rat. It's like a, a ship's rat. Uh, you know, like a, a, basically a New York City rat, but one that would live in the hull of a ship. Everybody draws that rat pretty much the same. Like, he has the same costume, no matter which, like, we've all decided, okay, he's a side character, this is how we know it's him, he's wearing these clothes. Everybody does it. So it's like, all right, I, I already know the costume for the guy, I just have to draw. And the other ones, it's like, yeah, he's gonna give a uh, total waistcoat or a sweater vest or just a uh, just a blazer. It's all going to work no matter how you draw. But it was like with Mouse Guard, I cherry pick for architectural and furniture and things like that. Like if I want a certain building to look uh, actually medieval, okay. But if I also want to look at like Tudor Revival from the 1920s, which actually, I think to modern audiences, looks more castle-like than actual castles. I can cherry pick, I can do that. I can even pull in some art crafts references, some gothic references. Historically, none of it makes sense, but it's nice there, and the mice made it, and so now it does make sense. <laughs> but Wind in the Willows takes place at a very specific time. So I had to research Edwardian doors, windows, clothes, cars, pub signs, cupboards, like it was, I was making miniature replica furniture based on real furniture because I had to draw a badger's kitchen from a, a certain angle. Like, okay, well, now I gotta become a Edwardian furniture expert. Although badger is kind of an old man hermit, so maybe he doesn't have Edwardian furniture, he has older furniture, and he has an update. So, Wind in the Willows was hard. <laughs> I say there's no relief. Nothing to keep, uh, get the creative juices going than uh, reading a nice, uh, hearty book about Edwardian furniture. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it's been, you know, it's been eye opening to hear you guys talk about the level of detail and how many, um, well, I guess levels is a good word, how many levels there is to, to world building. You know, David, I really like you bringing up. Um, culture, you know, that that is, that is an element that really, you know, I think make or break um, the believability of, of a world. 
So I was curious, you know, and maybe Charlie can kick us off, um, but in, in your words, what's your advice for someone who wants to take on the task of creating a fantasy epic or, or building a world? Like, should it be a conscious effort to first have the world built out, or, or should that come in a process or later in stages? Are there any, like, quantifiable or, or pivotal elements that they shouldn't, like a checklist or something? Or is it just inherent, inherent because of the, um, the genre itself? Well, first I would say, do not make it medieval Europe. <laughs> because there is a billion medieval, pseudo medieval Europe. And if and you do, make the population animals. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, and, so, and there's loads of uh, civilizations and uh, just that are really interesting and it's really fun to look around at and then just do a lot of research, forget about it and write. Um, I just, uh, and there are things that come into play. I have a novel coming out in September called The Queen of Summer's Twilight and uh, it's set in contemporary Inverness, Scotland and then goes over into fairy. And I, I planned out this certain scene and they were gonna go into the, the deserted palace of uh, the Queen of Elfland. And I started writing the Golden Spires and all that stuff, and I went, that's really boring. How many people have read about, written about the Golden Spires of Elfland? And then I started thinking about it and, going, and this whole Celtic thought of the health of the leader is, uh, rep is represented by the health of the country. And my Queen of Elfland had given her mind away because of circumstances in the book and she was mad and gibbering. So I went, oh, that means the whole country is, the, the ground is dead, the trees are dead, the palace might be crumbling and it became much more interesting to describe all that. And it just was like, because I was really bored <laughs> with writing the golden spires of Elfland and it became a really very strong element in the, uh, the book and I just worked off of it. If your world building attempt is because of a narrative, well, let me start the other way. If your world building is attempt is because you are creating a playable RPG setting, <laughs> then do that, right? <coughs> Plot every point on the map, describe, you know, figure out everything about how that place works, leave no stone unturned. If you are writing a narrative, do not do that. Um, you're, you should almost, like, you can have vague ideas. I did make a map, but my map was literally like Lockhaven, the most important place for where my, my purpose is, is in the center. And then I just put a bunch of dots and made up a bunch of names. And I thought, the rest will come to me. That's it. And then when my characters explore those places, that's when I now have to do the work. But if I tried to do the other stuff, I'm going to end up like the friend of mine who wanted to come up with a D&D campaign that wrote a thousand year history for our D&D campaign that we never actually played because what he really just made was a history binder of some fictional world that nobody cared about. There was no entry point. Um, this is more of a storytelling kind of a, a, a piece of advice, but you as the author have ideas for the story that are running at full speed. You've been sitting with this story in your mind. You know it. You, you understand it. Someone who's coming in who doesn't have that history doesn't know it. Things that are obvious to you aren't obvious to them. So I always relate it to like car traffic. Your mind is moving at freeway speed. Your audience is just pulling out of the driveway. It's not fair to ask them to be driving 60 miles an hour or 70 miles an hour again. You have to give them some side roads and an entry ramp up onto your story. You have to have characters that slowly introduce them to this. Don't give them a wall of text that reads like an atlas or a history lesson. Introduce them with characters and story that they care about, and then let the world building blossom and go out. I love that. Yeah, yeah that was awesome. That's good. Uh, another one for, for the both of you. Um, comic books aside, Edwardian uh, furniture digest <laughs> aside, what are some uh, non-comic books or yeah, non-comics that um, have really you felt made you a better 
writer within like this fantasy umbrella. And then I'll, I'll add to that as well. Um, can you give us maybe some, what you would consider must read fantasy deep cuts? So thinking off like the, the, the main path of, you know, people think fantasy books, what are some of your favorite deep cuts that you think people should check out? Uh, Gorman Gas by Mervyn Peak, which is kind of, kind of, like uh, Charles Dickens writing a very strange fantasy novel. Uh, the King of Alpine's Daughter by Lord Dunsany, which has the most beautiful words in the world. Um, the Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter, which just with her choice of words and description changes a lot of fairy tales that you've read a million times. Um, if anyone has ever seen The Company of Wolves, the movie, The Company of Wolves, uh, it was written, co-written by Angela and it's based on one of her short stories. But The, the Bloody Chamber is a really gorgeous book. And, and you know, Lord of the Rings, uh, Earthsea, that's pretty good. <laughs> that, that, that. Um, I know you said comics aside, although the book that I'm going to recommend, while it's a comic, it's not like a comic you've ever seen, uh, Cursed Pirate Girl by Jeremy yeah. Gash. I'm actually wearing It's Jeremy's birthday today, by the way. Go by his table, tell him happy birthday. <laughs> um, I'm wearing a Cursed Pirate Girl shirt. Um, it's a nautical fairy tale adventure, um, and it is illustrated. Basically, imagine uh, Albert Thewer. Um, is illustrating a comic book. Um, it's it's amazingly detailed and it is world building beyond. Um, I, I have, uh, Jeremy's a good friend of mine. I have harassed him for years that he needs to do a creator commentary because I I've, I've had the pleasure of watching getting to watch him make pages or have him tell me you know, show me pages in person and then he starts pointing out details and he starts telling stories about like. Oh, see all the stuff in the border? Well, this one's chasing this one because he stole it. And I'm like, where is that in the book? Where's that story? And he's like, it's, it's there. It's, it's just, you know, it's there in the border. I'm like, but you, you need to write all this stuff down so that everybody else can eventually know it when you're dead. So, uh, <laughs> he told me that when he's done with the book, he'll do, a, he'll do a director's cut commentary. I'm trying to get him to do it before then, just in case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's a, I think that's like... Not enough people know about it, and it's just an amazing example. And then my deep cut fantasy that's not a comic is a book called Crow and Weasel. It was written by Barry Lopez and illustrated by Tom Port. Um, it's a, a Native American kind of tale, coming of age story, um, where it's, uh, the illustrations have very human bodies, but uh, anthropomorph anthropomorphized heads um, of a crow and a weasel. And it's the anthropomorphic tradition where it's not even so much that they are a crow and a weasel, it's that things that go along with what we associate with a crow is the personality of crow. And things that we associate about the personality of a weasel is the personality of weasel. Good stuff. All right, I'm, I've got one uh, last question for you guys from, from me before I open it up to the audience for Q&A. Um, and trying to figure out maybe if you have, how many of you have questions for David Charles? All right, good, good. Um, if you guys want to start forming a line, uh, just right here in the center, I'll come down from Mike so we can hear uh, a little better. Um, but while you guys do that, uh, one last question for you, uh, Charles and David. Um, I'm going to bring it back to, to comic books, right? And I was curious about your advice for aspiring comic creators. You know, what's something that you wish you were told when first entering the industry that might have made your lives a lot easier? <laughs> <laughs> Charles, you just laughed. You just laughed like, do we add another hour on this thing? Yeah, that'd be that. Don't work for Marvel, don't work for Disney. Shots fired, shots fired. You won't get money, royalties. I did comic books for DC Comics in 1990, and every four months since then, I've gotten a royalty check. It's a very nice thing. Uh, I did, you know, wrote and drew and painted the Spider Man graphic novel. I got two checks, and then they just decided to forget about the other 100,000 copies that they sold. Yeah. And they just look at you going, you can sue us. <laughs> you know, so that, that would be my advice. Uh, work for yourself, do what you want to do. 
Uh, do what's in your heart. Uh, every once in a while you need to do something big and splashy, but most of the time you need to you know, just do the story that's inside that needs to come out of your head. Excellent. Yeah. The, the barriers for entry, like people talk about how do you get into the industry or how do you make comics, and it's like the, the answer is you make comics. Yeah. <laughs> you get draw, draw stories, get them finished, and then publish them online, self publish them, print on demand. Like there aren't very, there's no gatekeepers right. anymore. Um, sure, it's going to take some work to get noticed and build a good body of work, but the way you do that is by starting. Like, no, nobody comes out fully formed. You, you do some stuff that's not your greatest work, and then the next one you try to make better than that, and you just keep going. If you wait until you're ready, you're never going to be ready. Thank you. That was great advice. Great advice. Thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause for that. that was great. <laughs> uh, take a few guys to get some questions. You guys can uh, dive deep for these, and you know, let's get some answers. All right. Hey, how you doing? Give me your name. Any you questions? Um, it's Bernadette. I'm uh, currently dressed as a uh, storytelling cobbler. Um, and uh, one of the things that I really want um, to appreciate uh, appreciation for is the desire to um, increase diversity in, in comics. And you're talking about, you know, let's try to get stories that go and love, you know, medieval Europe. But how do you do that um, when, you know, you're coming from a, a European background? Um, you know, where do you find that balance with that? As you're talking about, you're saying that there's no gatekeepers, but you know, if you're, you know, try to represent mm -hmm. a culture that you don't come from, you know, you get criticized. If you try to write just from your own culture, there's criticism. How do you find that respectful balance of trying to? improve diversity as it's represented, trying to, you know, like I said, so that the stories that you want to see represented, I mean, have you? Mm -hmm. uh, about maybe eight years ago, I had a, uh, I published a book with a, a fairy magazine because I knew that they would Publish it exactly the way I wanted it, uh, and I didn't have. To, there was only two people to have to deal with, and uh, they did a beautiful job with this book. And I was, and it's my art and poetry, and I was looking at it, and it, and I didn't think about it until I had the book. And I was leaping through it the first time, and I went, "Okay, there's a hundred pages here, and there's one person of color," and that made me feel really awful. So I actually repainted one of the paintings that's in the book, but it's not in the, you know, it's from the book, but it's not in the book because that was already, if they go back to press again, that won't be, uh, it'll be in there. But it's, there's a whole lot of people that want to be gatekeepers. Uh, and there's a lot of people that want to be upset. I don't know why, but they want to be upset. They want to be angry. Uh, I have this, the novel that I was talking about, The Queen of the Summer Twilight, the major character is uh, half Scottish and half Jamaican. And I had went, it went through two agents who said, I don't know what to do with this book, because you'll be killed if you put this out. Uh, so unaged, I found a publisher that wanted to print it uh, in a smaller press in England. Uh, and it's, you just have to do as much research as you can and talk to as many friends that may be of that ethnic necessity uh, and, and be respectful and write your story. If you want to tell, if that's the story you want to tell, just tell it. If you're worried that your cast isn't diverse enough because you are kind of locked into a location, geographic location, are you, you have to ask yourself, are you, am I doing a historical document or am I doing a fantasy? Because if you're doing a fantasy, you know, we, we love doing the elevator pitch of it's this plus this. So if you want to show kind of a normal European medieval town, but then bring in where the denizens are more like American uh, Native Americans and bring that culture, but to that setting, that's interesting, right? So you can, you can populate it however you want. Rainbow diverse, where there's you know two of everybody, or 
just a totally different group that's a mishmash, or maybe even that there's only one person of color and that's part of the story. Like, however you want to do it, what story you want to tell. And then in terms of being worried about stepping on toes or not being respectful, come from a place of earnestness, and I would say not just talk to your friends that are people of right. color or part of those, those groups, talk to, if you have opportunities to talk to other creators um, who are in those groups and come, it's, it's always okay to come from an earnest place of I don't know. Like if you go to somebody and say, hey, I'm, I'm worried about this, and just talk to me because I don't know. I don't know, I don't know the answer. Can you help me find yeah. the answer? That's the best place to start. Great advice, good question too. All right, next up, what's your name, what's your question? So, uh, my name's John, and you mentioned earlier, like there's a lot of creation in fantasy, and that can be of not humans being involved in the scenario and the environment, and you mentioned that, like you said earlier, about Crow and Weasel, they have certain personalities that you associate with those animals, and they influence how you portray those characters. So I was wondering how not human characteristics and ideas that are associated with them help and hurt the world building process because if you know you got your classic depiction of the dwarf well if you don't make in certain elements like oh, obviously they're working stone well, well you know, what if they don't but is it helpful because you have more of a focus or does it hurt because it takes away it's on the story and the world um i mean i so the danger with whatever you populate your world with whether it's non-humans like trolls and you know, goblins, or if it's uh, berries, or if it's um, different animals. The, the problem is always going to exist of other. There's a group, and then there's obviously something not of that group. So, and anthropomorphized fiction always has this problem. If your protagonists are things like mice, then obviously weasels, snakes, things like that are the bad guys. And that's a tradition we're all used to, right? But there is a, there is the danger, because people start to read it as a, as a human metaphor. There is the danger that what you're actually saying is a weasel is born a weasel. There's nothing they can do about that. And we've already determined the bad, they're the bad guys. So now we've decided that an entire race is just born evil. Well, if we try to translate that back as a metaphor for humans, that's really not okay. Right? So with Mouse Guard, I tried my own way to both pay, like, make that tradition work, but also go, hey, as a metaphor, I'm kind of shuffling the deck a little so that it's not just a hard and fast rule. But no matter what it is, there's going to be your goblins, and then there's going to be people outside of a goblin community that they're not going to trust. Right? And then you've got this problem. You've got, you've got somebody and an other. Um, and you got to be careful with that, about what you're actually saying, and figuring out where it's okay for it just to be a fairy tale, and where it could also be misinterpreted as a morality lesson, an actual human morality lesson. Someone said, "What he said." <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. Well said. Awesome. All right, how you doing? What's your name? Which question? I'm Gary Rogers. All right. Uh, well, I wanted to ask you about environmental storytelling. As a creator myself, I noticed one of my weaknesses is that, uh, well, my mind's eye is fairly limited. If it doesn't need to be in the scene, it won't be in the scene, which kind of is, is like the inverse of world building disease, where they don't have enough information. Uh, as you said, that was the deep dive you did into the Edwardian architecture, <laughs> furniture design, and clothing. <laughs> yeah. All right. Don't Isn't do it? that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know when to stop. Well, I had to do that because it was with the willows, but you don't, just in general, don't do that. Um, do you want to know what to So every, uh, oh, who was it that had that thing about, <coughs> it was a Toph who drew something and said, I spent the first half of my career putting too many lines in, and I, it was the second half of my career figuring out which ones I could leave out. <laughs> it was something along those lines. But, Everything that goes into an illustration conveys something. 
right? Um, there's something about minimalism that's conveying a certain amount of story. It's actually leaving gaps for the reader to fill in, which means that everybody's experience reading that could be slightly different because they're filling in those gaps with their head, with their own mind. And there's a benefit to that kind of storytelling. But if you as a storyteller are like, no, my audience isn't getting what I'm trying to put across, the mood, the genre, the setting just isn't coming across, then you need to add more details. The place where you go too far is where you're not actually producing story anymore because you're just drawing backgrounds or you're just doing research or building models of Edwardian furniture. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. How much of this furniture did you build? No. <laughs> <laughs> one, one step past enough, actually. Okay. Just one step yeah. past enough. Charlie, you had to shake your head when uh, uh, an ingredient from David uh, brought up that point. Do you feel the same way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you say that? Um, yeah, it's. Wait, let me, that, let, me, let, me, let me say this. So sometimes, Charles, you'll draw every every twist, every turn, every knot, every root of a tree. Uh -huh. And other times they fade off into the background, right? Where do you decide within each illustration what's going to be a very concrete, detailed part of it and what's not? Um, Maybe that's a better way of maybe, like, when do you maybe. put it in, when don't. Uh, when, when is enough enough, enough though? When is enough yeah. enough? Well, I'm, I, I leave more and more not there. Um, and it's because I find as I grow older, the artists that I really respond to aren't putting every single detail in a piece. Um, uh, I, I don't know if any you'll know these people. There's, uh, <laughs> I went to dinner with uh, uh, Storanko last night, a whole bunch of other people, and there was this whole conversation going on. And I woke up in the middle of the damn night having a conversation with him in this dream about artists that I liked, and I'm going, what? Why am I here? You have uh, people. But uh, there's uh, Lorenzo Matati, who's an Italian artist that uh, almost expressionistic, extreme colors, and I look at those, and it's so far away from what I do. That's one of the things I would suggest as a creator is looking at stuff, reading stuff that has nothing to do with what you do, and it sort of filters back in. Uh, uh, I, I look at uh, Hergé, who did Tintin, Tintin, Tin, Tin, uh, and it's completely different than anything I've ever drawn. Sometimes I wish I drew like that. Uh, I look at Tove Johansson, who did uh, the Mo uh, Moomin Land, and I, sometimes I want to be able to draw like that, but I don't. You know, uh, but it's you can look at those things and figure out what they're leaving out that works, and think about that, and. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't happen overnight, and it'll just filter into your drawing. Um, and it, whether I, I leave a misty tree or not is usually just my patience or deadline. By whim. By whim. It's whim. It's a lot of whim. If, if you're, if you're, if like we were kind of, we actually went in the opposite direction. We talked about when to leave stuff out. If you're struggling for figuring out how to get more in. I would say have a folder or a couple folders yeah. on your desktop of inspiration things, and they can be. Lots of stuff. They can be photos you take when you're out on walks. They can be photos that you just grab off the internet. Take photos of objects. Take photos like go through an antique store. Take photos of a bunch of stuff that you think yeah. is cool. Go to or or any store. This it, it used to be the hardest thing in the world because you would have to. Yeah, there was no internet, and you had to go buy books or magazines. I can still remember buying this giant pamphlet magazine on guns because I needed to know what does one particular gun look like. And nowadays you just type it into Google and there it is. There's a hundred pictures of it. And like, oh God, thank you. Almost like they basically do a Pinterest board, but keep it private, keep it on your desktop. And you'll actually start to see patterns of what you're drawn to, what you're inspired yeah. by. And don't think that you have to create every background or everything like just out of your mind, like looking at a blank piece of paper and then just drawing it or writing it. You can look at a bunch of stuff to get inspired mm -hmm. and reference. You don't and, have to and have if, it. If you're if yeah. you're doing a graphic narrative, you don't have to put everything into every pattern. Sometimes a blank background. Yeah. You 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 have to remember that people are reading it and your eyes get tired. Especially if you're old. <laughs> <laughs>
has a white background. It's a very nice thing. And I'm not going to try to apply that. I'm actually an animator. I'm oh, trying okay. to figure out how I can use light backgrounds uh -huh. without it looking like I just got lazy. <laughs> right. Well, a lot of that's negative and positive space. And yeah. You got any, you got any, tar any tartar pops you can do? The animation person you're going to need to look for for how to do minimalism that doesn't look lazy. Yeah. I haven't thought about that. Thank you. Good question for the answers. Thank you. All right, we got two more questions. Uh, let me give you your name. And my name is Chris Ewan. Um, since you brought him up, and uh, he's also well known for his world building, I want to ask about Mike Mignola. Um, amongst people that I know that are artists, Mike Mignola has this godlike standard um, or reverence for his art. With you guys, it's very obvious to even the lay people why your work is fantastic. It's very accessible. But when you introduce somebody that is not familiar with Mike Mignola's work, it's harder for them to see why he's so great. And so my question is, if you were talking to a lay person and sharing with them Mike Mignola's work, what is it that you're picking out of that work that a lay person would then be able to start seeing that would help them appreciate work that's like his as opposed to yours, which has those intricacies and those types of things that obviously people recognize immediately. Mike's greatest skill as a world builder is mood. It's there from panel one and it goes all the way through. And uh, even though I know he wouldn't call his comics work effortless, I think him uh, in injecting everything he draws with mood I do think that's effortless for him. It just oozes up. Mm -hmm. So you know exactly the feel and genre, how spooky or even not spooky any particular moment in that book is because it's it's right there to make you look at it. Some of the other stuff is harder to, to appreciate as a layperson without studying it. Um, his beat by beat storytelling, how, how many panels it takes to tell something, to tell a moment. Sometimes he'll stretch it out into multiples. Sometimes things happen very quickly. How he does that, what shapes those panels are, how big those characters are within those panels. Mike Mignola, I think, is one of the best storytellers, and I think that's not the thing he gets credit for. He gets credit for the big shadows and design work, and he's great at that stuff, too. But his panel by panel storytelling, I still think, is one of the best. Uh, in and the and he uses that European thing of you'll have really brilliant storytelling and then there'll be a little tiny panel of uh, a limb with a leaf on it. Yep. And it just, and that is the total, that's storytelling because it's, you're pausing, it's pausing, you're taking a breath, and then you're going to the next thing, and it's something you have to think about when you're. It's almost like a, a German or Norwegian uh, filmmaking technique. It's, uh, it's uh, Hermann Hoopen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> who did the Towers of Bois Marie, in, uh, he's a Belgian artist who's a brilliant storyteller, um, love his work. And then the other, uh, I, I wanted to be Mignola for a really long time, and I tried really hard to draw like Mignola, and it's, it, and, you know, it's a futile thing because even if I got really good at it, at best I'd be a second-rate Mignola. Um, but what that meant was I really studied. People will look at his work and go, okay, he's all about skinny wrists and big blocky shadows and you're taking the wrong thing away. It's like looking at a house and appreciating its siding or the shutters. Like there is a, there is a structure and a foundation and a proportion to how, what size the windows are and where the stairs are in the building and everything. So if you actually start like literally doing drawovers and figuring out the proportions of everything in a panel and where he's drawing your eye and how he's, even though he doesn't color, I know he has hour long conversations with his colorist because he has a very specific color story in his mind of how the color is gonna affect mood and where he wants people's eyes to be going. Um, that's the kind of stuff that trying to get someone who's not familiar with his work to appreciate his genius is really hard because it actually does require deeper study. But that's one of the things, that's why artists that's why he's like an artist artist. That's why among all of us, we're like, oh man, Mignola. But it's because we've dissected it and gone, Jesus Christ, he's a genius. Like all the way down, he's a genius. Turtles all the way down, it's just genius, genius, genius. Yeah, I, think, I think one of my favorite phrases uh, I've heard uh, in describing Mike Mignola is deceptively simple. Yeah, yeah, absolutely.
Good question. And it would help if you if you somehow found a way to explore lots of the European graphic novels because his sensibility is more. It's a really interesting. It's Frazetta and European. <laughs> Uh, sensibility mixed together, it's right. unlike anybody else. If you're trying to get somebody to appreciate the Mule too, don't don't hand them one of the giant tomes, or don't hand them like one of the big long stories. Hand them one of those real short ones, one of those like ten to twelve pagers. The Troll Witch is one of the ones that I love sharing with people. I also think it's one of the best examples of his panel by panel storytelling in terms of dissecting how many beats for each moment and how much text versus image and how that flows. Troll, troll which is one of his, his best like go-to lesson plan stories. And if they like breakfast, give them pancakes. That's good. <laughs> Only two pages. <laughs> All right, we got another question up here. Give me your name and question. Uh, I'm Matt, this, my name is Matthew. Uh, are there any particular worlds or works that you would like to illustrate or like to return to illustrate it? Uh, particularly Charles, I'd like to know if you ever considered working with Jeff Smith again, because Rose was so remarkable to me as a kid, uh -huh. which earlier you guys talked about how when you're adapting the work that's already been illustrated, you need to bring your own thing to it. And I'm sure you're, you're aware of how yourself differentiates, differentiates with Jeff Smith. Mm -hmm. He's very clean, you're so like yes. painterly yes. in comparison. And it gave me this whole different perspective of the setting of Bone. It was so well, beautiful it, and like historical. And yeah. just, I, I don't know, I just really want to see how that combines again. Well, we had other stories that we talked about. This just hasn't happened. But we, the reason why that happened is that my wife and I were visiting he and his wife, and we were, we were walking through Old Man's Cave, which is an actual state park in Ohio, and it's where a lot of bone takes place. And at a certain point, I went, well, Jeff, is there a backstory to all this? And he rattled off this amazing story, and I went, after I was going, are you going to draw that? And he went, no, no, I just came up with it all the way. Well, can I draw it? <laughs> uh, so you need to go on vacation with Jeff Smith again, yeah, so we'll get another yeah. Charles Mess. And we were supposed to have the tagline of uh, pure fantasy, no bones about it. <laughs> Never used it. Uh, and it was really fun. You know, he did his writing is actually extremely simple layouts with word balloons in there. And uh, it was a really fun relationship. That's fun. David, what about you? Is there, a, um, is there a green project that you hope to illustrate one day, or one that's on your bucket list? Um, I, I mean, I really need to be spending as much of my time doing mass art as possible, so doing like a whole issue of anything is, a, is too much of a commitment, I think. Uh, that said, I, I wouldn't mind at some point if, if Stars aligned doing a Turtles issue. I would love to do a Turtles issue. Turtles are the reason that I draw comics. That was the that was the book that made me realize that people make comics and not a company. Mm -hmm. It said right on the cover, he's been in layers. And right. then you start reading it and you're like, this is two guys making this crap up. This is awesome. Yeah. Well, that's a job? I want that job. I remember seeing, I, maybe it was the first issue of Fantastic Four I ever bought was either four or six. I don't know which one. But you know, it had Stan Lee and Jack Kirby signed it and I went, well, people did this. Yeah. You know, I've been reading comics for years and it never occurred to me that people wrote and drew it. And that it was like, well, if they can do it, I can do that. <laughs> Changed my life. Uh, and then cover, I mean, I've gotten a chance to do Turtles covers and Usagi covers and uh, a lot in key cover. Um, I'd be happy to return to any of those. And uh, the, one of the ones that, is, is not checked off on my on my list yet is Hellboy. I, I'd love to do a Hellboy cover. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Last question. We're gonna finish strong, right? Now I'll give you a new question. Hi, I'm Cal. Um, I was just hoping, um, as a starting artist, not me, no, but just in general, <laughs> uh, how do you how do you find your style, and what are some things that you think would be helpful to New artists that would help them find said style. I, to, to plug myself, I have a, a, a whole lecture of this up on YouTube called oh. called Drawing Like Yourself. Um, at least this is my theory about style. Um, the short version of it uh, is that people kind of mystify what style means, and the simple explanation is style is the way you draw. And the real question is, how can I draw better? How can I take what I'm doing and get rid of the flaws in it? Which means making it more readable, expressing the things you want to actually express, 
not making distracting points where people think you're not drawing something well. You know, there's a version of a bad drawing of a face where some, when somebody looks at it, they go, that person doesn't know how to draw a face. But when we think of it as, oh, that's a style, it's where that doesn't become distracting, it's artistically valid. And what it really just means is it's all the same stuff that we talk about about good drawing, whether it's abstract or realistic. It's about proportion and balance and how to make something readable and conveyable. So you have, it, everybody in here, if you're a drawer, if you draw or paint, you have a style. You don't need to go find it. You have it. It's the way you draw right now. If you're not happy with the work that you're doing and you need to figure out better ways to make your work more successful, start solving those problems on an artistic basis. Then that's your new style. But it's not like you found the new, it's not like you go shopping and like, oh, I think I want something more minimalistic. I'll take one of those. Oh, good. It's like the thing with Mignola where I go, people look at it and they go, oh, big blocky shadows, skinny wrists. That's Mignola. No, it's not. Look at the foundation of what he's doing. Look at the foundation of what you're doing, change it so that your work is more successful in terms of artistic merit. It can be as abstract and wonky looking as you want, it can be as realistic and photo real as you want, or anywhere in between, it just needs to be a successful piece of art. So how can you take what you're doing right now and make it better? Never be afraid to, to use an eraser. <laughs> the best tool any artist ever has. Those are some great questions. I appreciate all of you for being here today. Sitting in, um, David, Charles, thank you guys so much for your time. I'll, uh, you mentioned uh, shameless plugs. I love a good shameless plug, and I'll, I'll do one uh, on behalf of you guys. Please make sure uh, if you want to uh, meet these guys in person or tell them how great they are. Uh, for yourselves, please stop by their table. Uh, I think you guys are fairly pretty close to one another, like maybe just a little bit of space in between. We're both uh, right at the front of Indie Island, where the gold yeah. uh, tablecloths are. Fantastic, fantastic. My name is Roger Million. That was our panel for today. Let's give it up one more time for our two guests. <laughs>